Psalm 47. It's a psalm written to the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. It is certainly God's word. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of God, the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is highly exalted. Let's pray. Father, what a good word to start our time of worship with. A reminder that you are a great God and that it is only natural that we, your people, would sing your praises. God, I, I pray that, that you would just take our hearts and minds right now and that you would just remind us of what a majestic and good and sovereign and gracious God you are. So that as we sing, indeed, we might sing as those who truly believe our God is worthy of all praise. Lord, as we are reminded in the psalm that one day all peoples will gather together to praise you. Lord, let, it, let us take that to heart as well and be instruments that you would use to gather all people for your praise. God, may you be glorified in this place this morning, and may your people be blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you that the power of the cross, dear Lord, gives us the freedom to not only worship you each and every day, but to know our destiny. When, that, when the time comes, we breathe, our left, we breathe our last breath here, dear Lord, we take our first walk with you in heaven. Dear Lord, we thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blessings you give us each and every day. I pray you'll be with Pastor Don as he brings his message. Dear Lord, help us to hear it and live it out each and every day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship. Some good words we've been singing this morning. Um, go ahead and open your Bible to John 16. It's our, our third and final week together in John 16. As we go there, I'm going to tell you, about my only real courtroom experience was one jury selection where I did get to sit up and get asked one question before they rejected me. So the rest of my knowledge of what goes on in a courtroom is from TV, but they do this a lot, so it must be true. After the defense and the prosecution get done, they, the judge turns to the jury and gives them what he calls his final instructions. He's not going to go back in that room with them and deliberate. He's going to tell them what to do, and then he sends them off to do their thing. And in a way, that's what we have going on in, in John 13 through 16. Jesus is giving his disciples their final instructions. He is going to return to the Father. He won't be physically with them after that, but he is giving them their final instructions of what to do. In the last two weeks, we've looked at some of those. We saw... First of all, that the Holy Spirit would come and be God with them and, and go out and convict the world, write the New Testament and, and turn their eyes to Jesus. That was part of their final instruction. Then last week we saw they'd have direct access to God the Father during this time. And, and that He loved them and He wanted to give them what they asked during this time. So that was part of their final instructions. And that leads us to our passage this morning. I'm going to ask if you're able, in honor of God's Word, to stand one more time this morning. And we'll be looking at John 16, starting at verse 29. John 16, starting at verse 29. Uh, speaking of Jesus, it says, His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Father, what a good word for us to consider this morning. In days when the world around us is, is chaotic at its best. Lord, when, when we have no trouble looking out and seeing that there, there's nothing there to trust. Lord, what a good word from Jesus for us to consider today. So I pray that you would, you would help us as we do that. May your spirit who inspired John to write this, these words of Jesus, may your spirit write them on our minds that we might understand, on our hearts that we might be convicted, that we might indeed believe and commit and obey. God, use your word to accomplish your purpose amongst us for your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I don't want to spend too much time in, in verses 29 through 32, because I really want to hunker down on 33, but we do need to look at them. Uh, the disciples start off with quite the bold statement, right? 
Jesus has been talking about, oh, I was speaking in figures of speech, but later you'll understand. And they go, oh, okay, now you're speaking plainly and you're not using figures of speech. We get it now and we understand and you, you know everything. And, and, and this is why we believe you must have come from God. Somehow the disciples have come to the conclusion that they get it. I don't know how they came to that conclusion. I mean, they said he came from God, really good thing to say. That he knows all things, really good thing to say. But to say that they really get it? No, they don't get it. They don't get it. And, and Jesus understands that they're thinking still a little hazy. Because in verse 31, he says, do you now believe? They said, we all believe. And Jesus said, do you? Because the time's coming, and indeed it is now here, when you're going to be scattered. You're going to each go to your own home and you're going to leave me. Now, I won't be alone. The Father will be with me, but you'll have left me. Do you now believe? Jesus knows their knowledge is limited. It's kind of like, I remember the first time I, I cleaned the pellet stove in our house. It's kind of wedged in a corner and I, I knew there was this motor and fan I had to take out and clean back in that box. And I watched a video on YouTube, so I figured I knew exactly how to do it. I was like the disciples. I was saying, I know now. I see clearly. Well, a couple of weeks, a damaged impeller, and a new motor later, and some pain from leaning back there in the corner, it was done. I didn't really know. I just thought I knew. It was limited until I entered into the work. And by the way, it only took like two hours this year. Um, the disciples don't get it yet. That's Jesus' point. They're facing a future filled with hard days. I mean, it's going to be hard for them to watch the one they have followed for three years and loved and trusted nailed to a cross. In fact, so hard they'll run away. They're going to scatter. And, and that's just, it, it, like, it just, just weeks from when Jesus is talking. Before he left them and returned to the Father, they would leave him to go hide from the police, essentially. They have limited knowledge. They face dark days, and they're tempted to go into hiding. And as I read that, I think, you know, I'm no fortune teller, because they're evil, by the way. I'm no fortune teller, but that sounds an awful lot like where many of us may tempt to be tempted to be in days to come. And we may be facing troubling days of our own. We're already dealing with the virus, social restrictions, racism, riots, a hostile election season. And we are facing the reality that our own nation may soon turn to socialism and even cement its hostility toward babies in the womb even further. In days like these, we might be tempted to run and hide. I, I mean, I know as we talk, some of you kind of feel that way about the world around us. You're kind of tempted. You want to just go hide. There's a better option. Jesus gives these guys a better option, and he gives it to us too today. And I want you to hear this option and be encouraged by this. Instead of running and hiding, we just need to listen to what Jesus says in John 16, 33 and find peace. Because in John 16, 33, Jesus is offering his people a formula for peace in a world full of trouble. A formula for peace in a world filled with trouble. I need that today, and I, and I think you do too. So let, let's, let's listen in to see what Jesus has to say. First of all, his formula for peace assumes a world full of trouble. It assumes that that is the way it is. The middle of verse 33 says, In the world you will have tribulation or trouble. Starting in the middle of the verse, because that's where Jesus describes what's going on in the world, what the disciples are going to find themselves in is a world of tribulation. You know, since I called it a formula, we could say in math, this is the given. This is the thing that just is. This is the way it is going to be in the world, in the world between the days when Jesus returns to the Father and then when he comes back to the Father, you will have tribulation. 
in the world as you live and interact with the fallen people all around you, in this world you will have tribulation, you'll have trials, you will suffer persecution. And not just trouble for individual fallen people either. That the systems of this world are designed by fallen people, often designed by the enemies of God Almighty and His law. They're designed by the very people that stood against Jesus and still stand against Jesus. The systems of this world are going to be designed to bring trouble to the people of God. There will be tribulation. Paul, Paul knew more than his share of trouble and persecution and tribulation. He wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13, he wrote, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not may be or might be, will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul said it was, it was is a given. That is the way it will be for the people of God. Sometimes trouble will come to the world, if from the world to us, in the way of temptation, right? The fallen world around us tries to draw us into the mess they're in through temptation to sin. There's really nothing any more troubling to the soul of a believer than temptation to sin. At other times, it'll come in the form of persecution. We've known very little of persecution in our land compared to the rest of the world. Maybe a few unkind words and a few inconvenient laws now and then. But our brethren throughout the world know persecution is really a part of the Christian life. Persecution for following Jesus is a real thing and we should expect it. More frequent though than either temptation or persecution, I think, are the troubles that come simply because we have a dual citizenship right now. We are citizens of God's kingdom, devoted to Christ our King, living as citizens of a kingdom that too often calls right wrong and wrong right. How do you live as citizens in both of those without feeling tribulation and trouble? Maybe just as frequent as the trouble that comes to us in this world because in this world we remain much less than fully sanctified. I mean, what, what really troubles the soul of someone who's trying to find Jesus is when they look into their own heart and they see sin, right? I mean, I hope that is what really troubles the Christian. So in this world, Jesus says, you will have tribulation. His formula for peace assumes the world only brings turmoil. Jesus assumes that to be true because he knows it's going to be true. I mean, wasn't that Jesus' own experience in this world? You remember what he said back in a chapter ago in John 15 to his disciples? He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus' formula for peace assumes a world of trouble. In fact, as I read these words, I think I'm almost more worried that I don't experience more trouble. And I worry that maybe that means I'm just not following him well enough. Because he says, it will hate you. It will persecute you. So it, it assumes a world of trouble. But then, Jesus' formula for peace factors in the Holy Spirit in prayer. He takes that world of trouble and he factors in the Holy Spirit in prayer. Beginning verse 33, he says, I have said these things to you. That in this world you'll have tribulation. In other words, all that stuff I've been telling you is here for you as you try to live in this world of tribulation. To these people who are going to be suffering trouble in the world to us, Jesus says, that's why I said this. That's why I taught you what I taught you about the Holy Spirit, 
who's going to join you on mission and refocus your eyes on Christ and not on your troubles. That's why Jesus offers them peace and, and tells them of the way that the loving Father will listen to them and, and, and lovingly give them what they ask for in Jesus' name because in a world of trouble, what good news that is, right? He said, I've said these things to you. I said to you that you will not be left as orphans. That you have God caring for you. The third person of the Trinity is going to do the fathering work for you while I'm gone. Jesus isn't just teaching us things so that seminary students would have things to think about in their textbooks. He teaches these things about the Holy Spirit and prayer so that we might have peace in times of trouble. Not that the troubles go away, but that we have peace in the world where there are tribulations. Jesus teaches us these things so that we can live in these times. His formula for peace factors in the Holy Spirit and prayer. Our God is not a God of cliches. When our God considers the troubles that the world will bring into the lives of the saints, God doesn't say, hey, don't worry. It'll be all right. Don't worry, the troubles will end soon. He doesn't say, don't worry, just remember the good times. If you smile, it'll all seem better. He doesn't just say, this too shall pass. He says, I have told you the gifts I have given you so you can have peace even in the midst of the troubles that are going to be your lot in a fallen world. I've given you my Holy Spirit. You have access through prayer to the Father who wants to bring you joy. Have peace. His formula factors in the Holy Spirit and prayer because Jesus is the one who sends the Spirit so that we can pray. All right, Jesus' formula for peace. It assumes a world full of trouble. And again, it factors in the Holy Spirit and prayer. But we also see that Jesus' formula for peace results in peace in Christ. It brings us peace in Christ. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, there are tribulations. In Jesus, there is peace. Jesus wants you to understand that there is only one true place for you to find peace. Christ is the author. Christ is the bringer of peace to a troubled world, especially to his people in a troubled world. Think about it. At his birth, what did the angels announce? Peace on the earth. Right? He lived, he died, and he rose again. Why? According to Ephesians, so that he might reconcile enemies, so that he might make peace between sinful men and a holy God. He came to end the battle between man and God to, to bring true friendship there, which is real peace. Jesus, it says, is the promised king of the line of David who will rule forever in righteousness and peace. So Christ is the one who brings peace because he's the one who writes it, who creates it. And peace for us is only found then if we are in union with Christ, if we are one with Christ. In me, you may have peace. It's not just agreement with what Jesus is teaching that brings us peace. It is living our lives in Christ that brings peace. That's what Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, where he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I am in Christ. I am the old me 
crucified with Christ such that there is no longer an old me who lives. The life I'm living now, I live by faith in Christ. I am in Christ in my life. Paul says, my life is now not mine, but His life in me. Peace with God comes when we dwell in Christ. And peace with God is the foundation upon which we build peace with men and peace in our souls. This is also so important in the midst of the world's trouble. The peace we have with Christ drills down within us deep and radiates outward from us. In Ephesians, as Paul talks about how, how Christ reconciled man with God, he does it in the context of saying he brought Jew and Gentile enemies together, made them one man, and then reconciled them to God. So, so Paul even says that, that when, when Christ reconciles you to God, he does that by bringing you together with people who were your enemies. People you would not otherwise find tolerable in Christ are your friends, are your brothers and sisters. So, so this foundation of peace with God brings peace with men and women and peace in our souls. In Philippians, Paul writes about how our hearts are guarded by the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Something happens in us that we can't explain. If your walk with Christ is completely explainable, I will pray for you that you have a real walk with Christ soon. Because there comes to the believer a peace that is beyond our understanding, that, that, that just penetrates our souls if we are in Christ. Jesus' formula for peace results in peace in Christ. Now maybe we just need to talk a little bit about what peace is. It's not going to help you to talk about peace in Christ if we don't know what peace is. I, I fear that too many of us who call ourselves Christians understand peace as that feeling you get on a a lazy afternoon sitting on the porch watching the rain, listening to the soothing sounds of guitar jazz and drinking a lemonade. Now, I don't know. That, that peace is somehow a photo op. Right? That that is peace. And, and I follow enough people on Facebook. I really think they believe that is peace. Right? Th that's not peace. Peace is better than that. Peace is the reality of knowing that the one who is more powerful than you, who was your enemy, now loves you and calls you a friend. That is peace. Peace is knowing that, that you deserved all the punishment that God could pour out on you because of your rebellion, but instead... He loves you, wants to answer your prayers, bring you fullness of joy, and then one day gather you to Himself and spend eternity with you. That's peace. It comes not with mood lighting, but it comes with a real change in who you are in Christ. Because none of that happens without Christ. Peace is peace in Christ. So Jesus' formula for peace it assumes a world of trouble. It factors in the Holy Spirit in prayer. And it, it, it defines peace as peace in Christ. And then Jesus' formula for peace leaves us singing victory in Jesus. If verse 33 is, is just not written in the back of your mind forever, write it there. I have said these things to you about tribulation that, that, sorry, bifocals. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The world's got nothing. Trouble in the world, but peace in Christ. Why? 
Because the world and its troubles have met their rival in Christ and he won. Not will win. He won. Not I will overcome. I have overcome. Victory in Jesus. How did Christ do that? How did Christ overcome the world? Well, the world, the people who live in the dark night of their own sins, stand against God and against His people. And its greatest goal, the world's greatest goal, is to keep you from being His. From being sold out, following Him, glorifying Him. That is the world's goal, is to keep you with them in the dark, reveling in your sin. The world rejected Jesus, it said in John. When he came as the light, the world preferred the darkness. But he overcame the world by his incarnation when God became flesh, by his sinless life. No temptation ever defeated him. He was without sin. By his sacrificial death, the perfect, sinless Son of God takes on all that sin burden on himself, goes to the cross and bears the penalty for us. And then by his resurrection, by his resurrection declaring that the ultimate thing that, that, that defines the world and sin, which is death, has no more victory because he walked out of the grave. That's how Jesus overcame the world, by his death and his resurrection. He defeated darkness by being the light. The world can lay no claim on him. It can lay no claim on his disciples. It can lay no claim on us because the world is a loser. That's how Christ overcame the world. And we overcome the world by participating in him. In Him. If I have the pleasure of baptizing you someday, what I'll say is I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, buried in likeness of His death. Put you under. Raised again to walk in newness of life. And this is the part you're all glad about. I bring you back up. <laughs> right? But that, that, that under and up is so meaningful. There's nothing spiritually miraculous about being wet. But what there is is a testimony that the old me died with him. I was in Christ in his death. And that the, the new me rose again with him. I was in Christ in his resurrection. And I'm going to live in that light. He overcame sin, death, and hell. He overcame the world. Jesus' formula for peace leaves us singing that. Victory in Jesus. The peace we have in Christ is not the peace that, that comes from being defeated. It's not the peace that comes from a ceasefire. It's not the peace that comes from anything else except victory. We have the peace that comes with victory. Eugene Bartlett was a songwriter and a singer of gospel songs. In 1939, Mr. Bartlett suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed and he became bedridden. He wasn't able to tour and sing like he loved to anymore. Instead, he devoted himself to studying God's Word. Oh, that there were more Eugene Bartlett's already, right? He devoted himself to studying the gospels and as he did, he came to long for the day that he would be with Jesus. And as he lay in bed, thinking about that Jesus, he wrote the words to the last hymn he ever wrote, Victory in Jesus. Absent from the body and present with the Lord since 1941, I don't think Eugene Bartlett has changed his tune. I think he is still singing victory in Jesus as he has that, that taste of what it means. Now, Eugene's still waiting for the resurrection when, it, when I think his voice will get loud. But victory is ours in Jesus Christ. Victory. That's what you say when you win. 
not when you lose. Jesus' formula for peace assumes a world of trouble. Factors in the Holy Spirit in prayer. Make sure you understand that this only comes in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us that this, if we think about it enough, should lead us to celebrate and sing victory in Jesus. That was true for the disciples when Jesus spoke this in John 16. It is true today. For them, these first followers in Jesus, they were in a situation very much like our own. One commentator said this, he said, They, as we, had in human frailty to live their faith in an unsympathetic, often hostile world. They, as we, had their doubts and their fears. They, as we, had to hear the warning, In the world you will have tribulation, and despite every appearance to the contrary, they as we must cling to the hope and assurance, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The world is the source of troubles. Jesus has overcome the world. You can have peace in Jesus. That is good news. That is good news. If, if you receive the gospel of God's grace, If you trust and follow Jesus, you will receive all the benefits of the gospel. And there are very many benefits of the gospel. There is there's rescue from the eternal torment of hell. That's a real benefit of the gospel. There's also the eternal joy that begins in heaven and finds its fulfillment in the resurrection. That, that, that's a great benefit of the gospel. But there is a benefit right here and now that we dare not neglect. We are in Christ and He has defeated the world. The world that is at war with the followers of Jesus, they're not going to quit. They're not going to someday just suddenly love us for being Christians. They bring trouble. But Jesus, by His gospel work, has defeated that world. And we can have peace in Him and we can celebrate. We can have joy and we can sing about our victory in Jesus. Can you sing that this morning? Has, has the victory that Christ brought, has it brought you peace in your soul? Has it brought you peace with your fellow man? If it has, then you need to sing like you mean it. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that just in a moment, as you might have guessed. Let me pray for you first. Father, what good news. Lord, that, that Your Son Jesus, who, who came as the sinless Son of God to die for wicked sinners, did not just rescue us from eternal suffering and offer us eternal hope. Lord, Your Son has brought us peace right now as the victor over sin and death and hell. As the victor over the world that stands against us. Oh God, I pray that every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room would know that peace. Or for the one who does not, I pray that this would be the day that they would be able to say, I trust Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord, and for my peace, I trust Jesus. And God, for myself and my brothers and sisters in Christ, as we face a, a world of chaos, God, write John 16, 33 on our mind and our hearts indelibly. Lord, that we may never lose sight of the fact that we are in Christ and Christ has overcome the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I pray that uh, this morning, the, the Word of God, I pray that it is an encouragement to you. I mean, we are in chaotic times and, and I mean, the, the news is just unbearable to even watch. If you have hope in this world, you have hope in your enemy. 
And you have hope in the enemy that Jesus Christ has defeated. So give it up. Work for righteousness in this world. Ye who trust in Christ and desire righteousness and justice, get out there and vote. Okay? Everybody else is telling you to do that. I thought I would too. <laughs> but do that. But don't trust in the results of that for your peace. It will disappoint you. Trust in Jesus who has overcome the world. If, if this morning the Word of God has spoken to you in such a way that you need to respond, if you need to come forward and share that with us, if you need us to pray for you, if you need to even for the first time say, I trust Jesus and I believe that peace is mine, I ask that you'd come forward as we sing. But whatever you do, this morning, lean hard on Jesus and have that victory and have that peace. Please stand. Come and heal my 